Okay. Well, thank you uh, again for joining the Participation Reports webinar. My name is Anna Tolwinska, and I'm the Member Experience Manager here at Crossref. I work as part of the Member and Community Outreach Team, and it's uh, my pleasure to talk to you today about uh, Participation Reports. So I will show you uh, during this session how easily it is to track what metadata you're registering with Crossref why you should be checking the report regularly, how to interpret the reports, and how to improve your metadata coverage. These webinars are run regularly, and today I have my colleagues Shane Smolian and Amanda Bartel on the call with me today. Thank you both for joining. Hey everyone. And Hi I think all. they will um, help me with any questions while I'm presenting. So before we jump in, I'm going to take a quick poll. Um, let me see if we can launch the poll. Um, okay, just a second. All right, I'm going to launch this poll and I would like everyone to answer this question. Um, all of the metadata I collect is automatically sent to Crossref. If everyone um, that can see the poll and can easily answer and participate in it um, could um, now make your selection, that would be fantastic. And I'll talk about this a little bit later on in the webinar. Um, so keep this question in mind. And it looks like I think uh, most people have answered. So I'm going to end the poll now and share the results. So I think we can see that everyone uh, or most of um, uh, the attendees on the call are not sure whether they send uh, all of the metadata that they can uh, possibly uh, send to Crossref. Um, and one person said no. Uh, so yeah, please keep this in mind. Uh, I will get back to this later on in the, in the webinar. Okay. So I'll go ahead and get started now by telling you a bit more about the reports. Um, so what are the reports? Uh, they are a place where you can check what metadata you're registering with us. Uh, they are open and free to use by anyone. Uh, they allow you to track the levels of metadata over time. This is handy if you're using a service provider or if you're not directly responsible for registering the metadata yourself and would like to see what's going on. And they allow members to see how they measure up to other members, see where the gaps are so that they can be improved. Uh, they're about two over a little over two years old now. We launched them in the summer of two, 2018. Um, they were in beta until recently, uh, our phase one, but we're constantly thinking of how to improve them. Um, so if you have any feedback, please let us know. So why um, did we develop these reports? So initially, uh, it came about mainly because we were uh, hearing from our members at conferences and um, on calls and meetings that they're not always sure what metadata they're registering with us. Uh, we always assumed that our members knew exactly what they were sending us, but that was not always the case. So we decided to make it easier for our members and ourselves as well to see what metadata was being registered. Um, this data has been available for quite a while uh, via our REST API, but not everyone knew how to que query our API as it's not very user friendly and it's more geared at machines um, than humans, so not an easy to use interface. Oh, and I just, I don't know whether I launched another poll, but I'm going to close it. Hopefully it's gone now. <laughs> that did not happen as intended. Um, number two reason um, 
was that participation reports uh, made it easier for our members to see what was missing and to fill in the gaps uh, to help them update their metadata. Um, and so we, you know, we decided how how can we expect our members to fix something if they're not really sure that is it's actually actually missing. And lastly, the reports um, the reports uh, allow our members to track their progress and see uh, if what they have been up, you know updating is actually being reflected in Crossref. So this brings us back to the poll at the beginning of the webinar. You may think that you're sending Crossref a lot of metadata, uh, but it's uh, only what may be required and not the additional optional uh, metadata that you could be sending to Crossref. Okay. Next, uh, next up, um, we have this slide, which is uh, where does the metadata in Crossref end up? So because Crossref's metadata uh, that you send us is standardized and machine readable, it is very useful to many different organizations that make your content more discoverable, more useful, and um, uh, easier to find for researchers. And here are a few examples. So I'll, I'll let you look at the slide. Um, there are different types of uh, tools that you know, are being developed every day that kind of run on Crossref's metadata and make your content, uh, put your content kind of on the map um, and in front of your readers. So when registering your metadata in Crossref, it's also very important to keep in mind that the metadata is correct, that there are no errors, typos, um, et cetera, that it's complete. So all of the fields that you can manage to register with us, not just the required fields, but um, all of them. So not just the first author, for example, but all of the authors, uh, publication dates, anything that's not required. Um, ask your authors for um, ORCIDs um, if they have them and funding information too. And pretty soon we will be accepting ROAR IDs. Um, so if um, they are uh, available to any institution and an organization and authors can affiliate themselves with a ROAR um, so they can submit that to us as well in the future. I think it's coming soon. And also make sure that your uh, metadata is all up to date. Talk to your vendors or the uh, production team that may be responsible for registering metadata and make sure that if there are any updates that they're um, sent to Crossref as well. And once you update your metadata, you can ex expect it um, to, you can expect to see it in the participation report in about 24 hours and all updates are free of charge. So let's actually see how participation reports uh, work. So you can navigate, um, let's see. You can navigate to um, www.crossref.org slash members slash prep. Um, when you click on it, you will come to this page uh, where you can enter in uh, your organization's name. Uh, Today, I'm going to be looking at National, um, National Institute for Health. Let's see. Sorry, I have this bar right in front of it. And this should bring back, uh, bring up a variety of different names that start with National Institute, for example. But today I'm, I'm looking at the National Institute for Health Research. Um, and when you end up on this page, uh, you will see that the name um, of the organization is displayed here. So let's say you selected an incorrect name um, or there was a typo or something, you can always go back to find a member and start again. Um, you can select it from the list. So this is where the publisher name is. Here on the right, you will see total registered content items. 
And that is reflected of all of the content items that are registered in Crossref, uh, but they're dependent on this uh, drop down, uh, which is set by default to current content. So right now we're looking at the most recently published articles, anything published in 2018, 2019, and 2020. Current content um, is actually the year that we're in and two prior years, um, and that's how you define current content. Uh, if I were to change that to all time, then we would see exactly how many DOIs in total are registered by this particular member in Crossref. But usually when you land on this page, it defaults to current content. So you may be surprised to see a lower number than you expected, but it is dependent on uh, the date range that you select. Um, you can also look at the older content back file, uh, which is you know, a slightly higher. Um, uh, but yes, all time will show you the total registered content items um, since the member joined Crossref. Uh, on the other side, um, you will see another drop down on the left hand side um, that will show you the content types that that particular member is registering with us. So in this case, um, they have two different content types, at least um, that has been registered in the current in the last three years. Um, if you're not sure if you're expecting another content type, for example, if you're registering um, book chapters, but they were registered um, before current um, the current content date range, they may only show up after you click on all time. As you can see, a data set showed up um, when I selected all time, but it wasn't visible. Uh, under current content. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So if you want to look at it holistically, it's always good to select all time just to see exactly where you're, uh, where you're at. Um, but since we're on current content, um, we can select uh, between the journal article or the reports. Today we'll focus on journal articles, um, but you can, we, I can uh, later show you different content types as well and what the coverage is. Uh, you can also, if you have more than one journal, you can look at um, journals uh, specifically. Um, so you would start by typing in the journal title name. Uh, so for example, this particular member has about um, five journals. So we'll look at you know, one of them. Um, or if I wanted to see another, uh, let's say this one, um, I can select that one as well. Uh, so you can look at each individual title. This is very um, uh, good if you're an editor and if you just wanna make sure that everything that you're sending to Crossref is uh, going uh, through correctly, um, it's a good idea to check uh, title by title. But now, um, this section, the bottom section, shows 10 different metadata elements that we think are really important uh, that help your content be uh, more useful to your readers, uh, more discoverable, and um, help you know, the research process uh, move forward. The first one, uh, which we will be looking at, are references. And what this really means is that 100% of the DOIs that you see here have references registered. So about 854 DOIs have references registered as part of the metadata deposit process. If you're ever confused what you are uh, looking at, or maybe if you forgot uh, the definition of what you're looking at, you can always hover over the little I and it will tell you exactly what you're looking at and what the percentage means. So in this case, it is percentage of content items or DOIs that include reference lists in their metadata. Next up, we have open references. And this is just um, part of uh, how, whether the references that you deposit here are visible to the public or are limited in some way. Um, if you see 0% here, that means that they are not open to the public uh, through the metadata, so they're not available through the metadata feeds, and um, we can make that open for you uh, 
uh, you could just need to let us know. It's a really quick fix on our end. So if you do find that um, your references are set to zero, which is a default or was a default previously, not for new members, but um, for some of our older members, um, they may find that they have a zero percentage next to open references. So if you'd like that um, remedied or changed, we can do that really quickly. And once again, if you hover over the I, um, it will tell you exactly what that is. So percentage of registered references that are set to be uh, openly available through uh, all of Crossref's APIs. So if it's 100%, they're available through all of our APIs. If it's 0%, they may be limited um, and not uh, shared publicly. Okay, next up we have ORCID identifiers. Um, so once again, 92% of the total 854 for the current content um, have at least one ORCID identifier registered. And ORCID IDs are really um, important because they let you, uh, allow you to precisely identify a researcher's work, um, even if uh, the researcher sh shares a similar name or uh, shares a name with another researcher. So that's really useful. Um, as I mentioned, in the future, we'll also be accepting ROAR IDs and they can be included as well. So that will definitely help with um, the affiliation um, uh, issues. Next up, we have uh, funder registry IDs. Uh, so once again, it's just the percentage of registered content that contains uh, the name and funder registry ID um, of at least one organization that funded the research. So if you have funder IDs, um, uh, you can uh, include them in uh, your metadata deposit. And this is a related funding award numbers uh, or grant numbers. If you have that as well, you can pass that on to Crossref. Um, so it's, uh, it's really useful because a lot of the um, research institutions like uh, to have to ensure um, and publishers have to ensure compliance with funder mandates and it allows funders to be to better tra track their published results. Um, so it's really important to keep keep that in mind. Um, and as I mentioned before, everything is uh, uh, structured and easily shared um, across a variety of different um, uh, services and discovery services that uh, share uh, your content with researchers. Next up, we have Crossmark enabled. Um, this is for anyone who's participating in our Crossmark service. So uh, Crossmark lets you uh, share with your readers whether the content content that you published is up to date or whether anything has been changed or updated since publication. Um, this just indicates that all of your content um, has a Crossmark policy associated with it and in, in turn um, should have a Crossmark widget which allows you to share that information and Crossmark is now free. It used to be a paid um, service. You had to pay a little bit extra on top of your DOI deposit for Crossmark, but I think it was January 2020 when we, this, we discontinued the fee because it's just extra metadata and uh, we don't charge for any other extra metadata here. So um, it is now a free service to use for our members. Next up, we have three different types of URLs that you can include to make your content richer and more useful to users and to yourselves as well. Um, so text mining URLs are the first type of URL that you can include uh, as part of your metadata deposit. And it's, it just allows you to um, share a full text URL that um, uh, can potentially be used for text and data mining uh, by researchers that you have an agreement with. Um, so it's just to make uh, a researcher's life easier if they're uh, doing uh, text and data mining um, through querying and machine, um, kind of machine to machine end. 
Next up, license URLs. Um, here you have a, a several choices. So you can include copyright licenses, um, open access license, for example, um, or just a regular copyright license if you'd like to indicate whether your content is or isn't open access. You can also include uh, a license pertaining to what text and data mining um, uh, researchers can and cannot do with your content. Um, so it's, it's quite useful and it's one of the more useful pieces of metadata that we hear um, researchers um, and other um, you know, organizations that use metadata, uh, they, they quite like um, to see uh, URLs, license URLs in uh, publisher, uh, for published uh, articles. And next up, uh, we have similarity check URLs. So if you are um, thinking of uh, joining similarity check or if you're already a similarity check, check member um, uh, or participating in the service, you um, need to register similarity check URLs with us. And th those are full text URLs that um, authenticate, which provides the uh, uh, similarity check plagiarism um, checking software um, indexes your full text content to keep in their database uh, so that others that participate in the service can check against this large database of text um, uh, to, to ensure that their content is not, uh, you know, plagiarized. So that is a requirement of joining the service um, and you need to deposit your similarity check URLs uh, with us. So in this case, this member um, is participating in the service because um, they're in compliance and they've registered most of the, uh, most of their DOIs have um, similarity check full text URL. And then last but not least, we have abstracts. So of course, not everything will have an abstract, not every type of content, but um, if your articles um, or books um, or book chapters or even reports um, have abstracts, we highly encourage you to register them. Um, just recently, there was an initiative that uh, launched um, called I4OA. Um, so they're encouraging everyone to share their abstracts openly. And one easy way to do that is to register them with Crossref. So um, yeah, in this case, 99% of the total registered content items or DOIs for this member have an abstract um, included. And another reason why it's really important to include abstracts is that they give more context to a reader about what, you know, about what they're about to read. So it's really, um, it's really crucial and makes your content uh, richer and more useful, so I would um, encourage you to do so. Okay, um, so that is basically the 10 key metadata elements. Um, I'm hoping that in the future you'll see other ones added to this page, like ROAR ID, uh, which um, will be uh, coming soon, I hope. Um, so maybe next year you'll see a new addition. Um, I also wanted to uh, just show you a different uh, content type. So in this case, reports, you will not see as, as many um, key elements uh, for other content types. So most of the uh, elements that we have decided to surface are for journal articles, but you are able to deposit other metadata for um, other content types as well. And um, I think Springer is probably a good one to show because they have, so yeah, Springer, for example, is a big um, member, a big publisher member, and they have a variety of different uh, content types. So you could see book chapters, you can deposit references or kids, um, you know, other, other things as well for book chapters, um, data sets as well, uh, references, uh, if you have them, license URLs. So uh, it's not just uh, about journal articles. Um, so if you do have, uh, if you're publishing a different content type, um, 
and be aware that that's possible as well. Um, and of course, if you select all time, other content types, you know, show up because maybe they were registered prior to 2018. So conference papers are similar to journal articles. They have all of the different key elements that um, you can register. So if you're registering conference papers, um, please keep that in mind as well. Okay, so I think that was a whirlwind tour. Um, I just wanted to point out the learn more uh, selection here. Um, if you click on it, you will be taken to our um, education pages, Crossref curriculum, and uh, it explains all of the different key elements that I just went through, references, why it's important, where can I learn more about it, um, and how can I improve my percentage. So um, I also encourage you to visit that page. Okay, so let's go back to our slides. I just took a couple of screenshots just in case. Um, and I think now I'm going to stop the recording. Um, let's see if I can do that easily. And we'll move on to the Q&A uh, section of the webinar.